Hello everybody, my name is Gerald Farker, Professor for Game Studies and Narrative Design, and today's session will be about the genre of the cyberpunk, and also the related issue of post-humanism. The presentation is mainly inspired by M. Key Booker and Anne Marie Thomas's Handbook of Science Fiction. So if you're interested in a topic, this might be a good start, with chapters on the history of science fiction, its various subgenres and authors. So coming to the structure of this presentation, the lecture has two main parts and will end with several study questions we may then discuss in class. Part one is more or less an introduction to the topic and to the genre of the cyberpunk and addresses also the related issue of posthumanism. It ends with a discussion about the genre's function and also some study questions. Part two will then address two cyberpunk masterpieces with William Gibson's Neuromancer and Philip K. Dick's to Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, better known in its film version, Blade Runner. So let's begin with the question, what is cyberpunk? And a brief overview of the topic in this video. A lot of people are hyped about this beautiful technological future. However, the name isn't just a name, it actually refers to a special subgenre of science fiction called cyberpunk. You can probably paint a pretty reasonable picture of the typical cyberpunk world just by watching the trailer. However, let's look at the genre a bit closer for a societal and philosophical nature. Cyberpunk is a genre based in a far dystopian future where technology and science has evolved to the point that it influences basically every part of our lives. It's defined by its views on man versus machine, or the concept of human identity, and societal anarchy. The term cyberpunk was coined by the author Bruce Bethke in his story titled Cyberpunk, which followed unruly kids using technology for the purpose of anarchy. This sparked a lot of interest, but it wasn't until 1982 that the genre became world-renowned with the release of the original Blade Runner film. This motion picture followed grizzled police officer Richard Decker as he pursues four artificially created people known as replicants. This beautifully rendered film explored a socially corrupt society and analyzed the nature of artificial intelligence. Were these creations just objects to be owned and controlled? Or could they be considered people too? It challenged the idea that artificial beings could be their own entities, gain their own memories, and lead their own fulfilling lives. Another work that explored the relationship between man and machine was a novel by the author William Gibson called Neuromancer. This story examined the cultural impact of technology on a global scale and the effects of body augmentation. And yes, there is an augmented samurai. And yes, that is super cool. This piece of art coined the phrase high tech low life, which is used today as a way to describe cyberpunk. One of the most monumental releases for the genre was the 1995 Japanese animation Ghost in the Shell. This is by far one of the most well-known examples of cyberpunk and deals with some extremely core topics. Ghost in the Shell follows Public Security Section 9, a task force consisting of AI, augmented and non-augmented people in the pursuits of combating corruption and terrorist threats in a world of body manipulation and physical enhancements. A key philosophy that Ghost in the Shell challenges was the understanding of what constitutes a human. With so many modifying their bodies to the point they were basically just machines, were they still human? Where is the line? Or is there a line? Alongside this, because there were true, complete AI creations, how could one distinguish between an augmented person and a true AI? The implications and social conflicts that rose from these questions culminated in a gorgeous and beautiful depiction of cyberpunk. Cyberpunk today is occasionally explored, but is often seen as a difficult genre to navigate due to its unique collection of influences and cultural focuses. A modern day example of cyberpunk is the game franchise Deus Ex. Looking at the most recent titles, Human Revolution and Mankind Divided, Deus Ex focuses heavily not just on the man vs machine concept, but also on the negative social impacts of it. In Deus Ex, you place Adam Jensen, a rugged, no-nonsense, black coat and sunglasses wearing police officer who, after a terrorist incident, was heavily augmented with mechanical parts. In the world of Deus Ex, Adam traverses a society on the brink of social uprising due to the extreme polarity between the augmented and non-augmented. This is made worse by the numerous private megacorporations controlling the market and branding augmentation in either direction. As you can imagine, this conflict defines the worldview and sets the tone for the entire experience. However, a major implication of this conflict is the allowance for exceedingly high levels of crime. With so much focus on calming the social and political climates, the criminal underworld is thriving through arms trades and manipulation. It becomes a vicious circle that really shows this side of cyberpunk quite well. To wrap things up, cyberpunk is a fascinating and very deep genre, but is often mistaken for just neon lights and cool technology. If you look deeper into it, you get a rich plethora of cultural and societal investigations. From books, to animations, to games, it's been demonstrated as a thrilling genre for really anyone to explore. Uh, actually, well, maybe not kids, but yeah, almost everyone. If you're interested in learning more about cyberpunk and experience its deep history for yourself, I highly recommend the above works, or even surfing the web, as there are plenty of fascinating conversations that have been had around the subject. And that's it! Thank 
The cyberpunk genre is probably known to most of us, as we are familiar with TV series like Netflix's Altered Carbon, games like the Deus Ex series, or films such as The Matrix. But let's head back for a minute to the genre's origins and its inception in the 1980s. Here, Booker and Thomas argue that, emerging in the 1980s as a literary movement significant for its rejection of the technological utopianism of much traditional science fiction, cyberpunk fiction explores the often uncomfortable close relationship between humans and technology. Cyberpunk, then, as a literary genre, but also as a social movement, emerged out of the troubles of the 1980s, out of aggravated fundamentalist tendencies in modern society, environmental crisis, and a renewed and solidified capitalism in the form of a free market which was regulated by multinational corporations based in and supported by powerful nation states. The question to be asked then is whether cyberpunk is really a rejection of technological utopianism, as Booker and Thomas claim, or is it rather a cautionary warning of possible negative outcomes of technology and its use, the dangers of what corporations could do with such tech, but also a deep frustration of the left and emerging counterculture. As you can see, the cyberpunk genre has at its core a radical social movement against oppression from the status quo and corporate power, but it can, of course, be associated with many related issues as well, some of which we may discern in this word cloud. Important to mention here are cyberpunk's connections to, of course, punk, illustrating the genre's counter-movement, then also technology and the futuristic element, laying the emphasis on technological marvels, but also nightmares that await us in a near or distant future. But cyberpunk can also be a style of fashion, with extravagant clothing in different neo-colors, a way of culture expression, and many, many other things. Maybe this image can illustrate the colorful diversity of the cyberpunk imaginary a little closer. Oftentimes, the genre is also associated with Asian culture in general, and Japanese culture in specific. But cyberpunk, as I have already implied, does not end with colorful representations of countercultures and oppressive state machine but it also explores the connections between man and the machine. Probably at cyberpunk's core, this lies the relation between humankind and the machine. As Booker and Thomas put it, in its near future depiction of biomedical and electronic body modifications, direct interfaces between human brains and computers, artificial intelligences equipped with human qualities and the electronic transcendence provided by new technological spaces. Cyberpunk not only calls into question what it means to be human, but also suggests that a post-human is an inevitable consequence of the dissolution of boundaries between human and the machine. This next step in human evolution, which has already begun and is taking place as we speak, is the fusion between organic flesh and artificial machines into a new species, which might be called the post-human, a cyber composed of human and mechanical parts or other different composite life forms. We will discuss in more detail our post-human situation next time, but for now it is already important to hint at it. So let's head back to the term cyberpunk itself which was first introduced by Bruce Beeth in a short story bearing the title and published also in Amazing Science Fiction Stories. It is, of course, emblematic of the juxtaposition of punk or countercultural activity with high technology, usually involving computers. In essence, Beeth's work laid the groundwork for many different narratives to follow. One of cyberpunk's major themes and conceptual spaces is to be found in the urban sprawl, as we will see also later in the discussion of Philip K. Dick's Blade Runner. The sprawl is a large urban area, as we know it from megapolises such as Tokyo, and is often depicted as both filthy and technologically advanced. 
Yet this texture, in combination with Cyberpunk's culture references, does not necessarily evoke disgust in the reader, viewer or player, or not only, but also a curiosity about a disturbingly fascinating world, which is partially unknown to us. The cyberpunk creates a surface texture that is evocative of the information overload characteristic of contemporary postmodern culture. It's about street slang, brand names, high art and pop culture references, and high tech jargon often creates a sense of dis disequilibrium in the reader who may find its intensity by turns exhilarating and confusing. The science fiction genre often does this to us having us explore fascinating worlds we can only grasp by comparing them to our own empirical surroundings. By doing so, however, connections emerge which might alarm us. In the movie Blade Runner, for instance, this fear about the future is addressed with multinational corporations taking over the planet and turning it into wastelands of our consumerist desires. Thus. One of the functions of the cyberpunk is certainly its cautionary warning about a near or distant world that could soon be ours if we fail to act in our present to stop such a nightmare come true. In short, cyberpunk, as Booker claims, is a fictional attempt to grapple with the realities of our postmodern condition. So let's come to a preliminary conclusion which might evoke more questions than answers. So, part one study questions. Referring to the world cloud, what is cyberpunk to you? What kind of cyberpunk fiction do you know? And what are these stories about? Also, you might ask yourself, what is the function of the cyberpunk genre? What are these stories to you personally? And finally, would you like to live in such a future, bereft of the natural world as we know it, and a new form of artificial nature. You might find yourself jacked into cyberspace, leaving behind the human flesh. In part two of this lecture, we will be discussing two of cyberpunk's major works, William Gibson's Neuromancer and Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, and also the vision of cyberspace and posthumanism. William Gibson is probably the most famous cyberpunk author. As his Wikipedia entry puts it, he is an American-Canadian speculative fiction writer and essayist, widely credited with pioneering the science fiction subgenre known as cyberpunk. Gibson also coined the term cyberspace for widespread interconnected digital technology in his short story Burning Chrome, and later popularized the concept in his acclaimed debut novel Neuromancer. These early works of Gibson's have been credited with renovating science fiction literature in the 1980s. Gibson's most famous work then is the Sprawl trilogy, including Neuromancer, Can Zero and Mona Lisa Overdrive. Set in the future, Neuromancer follows Henry Case, a washed up computer hacker who is hired for one last job, which brings him back against powerful artificial intelligences. Gibson gives us an exhilarating and truly euphoric image of cyberspace, leaving behind a vulnerable meat prison and escaping into the realm where everything seems possible. Booker and puts it like this. In a novel, anti-hero, console cowboy Case acts as a cyberspace via a neural interface with a computer, and such is his preference for the euphoric experiences in this virtual realm that he disdains the body as a meat prison. He's jacked into the cyberspace, where Gibson's almost exclusively male hackers exper experience this exhilarating disbodiment, or disembodiment. An episode where this is well illustrated are the events surrounding Molly Williams, a humanoid cyborg and Case's lover. Through technology, Case can experience the same perceptual surroundings as can Molly, without being present. The meat in Gibson's near-future universe can easily be reshaped and augmented, as evidenced by the cyborg assassin Molly Millions, Case's partner in a high-tech heist orchestrated by the AI 
Wintermute. In the world of Neuromancer, this technology is called SimStim, with which you can basically experience a different person's full sensorium, although not being able to act as them. So, as this Vikia entry puts it, SimStim is a technology that broadcasts or records someone's sensorium, experiences and sensory input. Persons are fit with a broadcast rig and their senses are broadcast live so that other persons elsewhere can experience them or they are recorded onto cassettes as memories which then can be replayed on a SimStim deck and can be re-experienced. This, of course, as Booker and Thomas put it, blur the boundaries between organic and artificial in a way that suggests post-humanity is an inevitability. But it is not clear that the hybrid post-human represents an improvement over the outmoded human. Turning back to the issue of urban space, such a vision of the future naturally has implications on the space surrounding us and how our world looks like. What Neuromancer could only imply then, Philip K. Dick's Blade Runner powerfully visualized on the film screen, an image of a destroyed planet. In both films, the original Blade Runner and the 2049 sequel, Los Angeles is depicted as a wasteland bereft of life as we know it. As Booker and Thomas put it, technology permeates all aspects of the characters' lives and Philip K. Dick's decaying urban landscapes are distinctive for the profusion of Kippel, the refuse of post-industrial society, a precursor of the gomi that clutters the cities of William Gibson's texts, which is the outcome of unrestrained consumer desire. Philip K. Dick is responsible for some of the best science fiction stories, including The Minority Report, We Remember For You Wholesale, or better known as Total Recall, The Man in the High Castle, and of course Blade Runner, or how it was called in the original Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. His fiction explores various philosophical and social themes and features recurrent elements such as alternate realities, simulacra, monopolistic corporations, drug abuse, authoritarian governments, and altered states of consciousness. He is probably most known for his 1968 novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which was later turned into the film Blade Runner by Ridley Scott. So, the main plot in Blade Runner follows Rick Deckard, a bounty hunter, who is tasked with retiring, that means killing, six escaped Nexus 6 model androids, while a secondary plot follows John Isidore, a man of subpar IQ who aids the fugitive androids. The book served as the primary basis for the 1982 film Blade Runner, and many elements and themes from it were also used in the film's 2017 sequel, Blade Runner 2049. Both Blade Runner films, then, deal with the question what it means to be alive, whether machine life forms, such as androids or replicants, as they are called, can express human emotions. This is taking a step further in 2049, where the male protagonist, KD637, a Nexus 9 replicant played by Ryan Gosling, falls in love with his personal hologram, played by Ana de Armas. So, in conclusion, Philip K. Dick's works heavily revolves around a sense of decay, of a dark future that melts film noir conventions with dystopian science fiction to create a shocking yet awe-inspiring outlook of what technology and mindless consumption could lead to. Let's then sum up a few of the main ideas in this lecture before coming to the second part of the study questions. So, first of all, cyberpunk as a genre addresses the relationship between human and the non-human. It imagines a counterculture that stands up to tyranni tyrannical corporations. It also imagines a technologically fueled world where nature as we know it has become extinct. It envisions a new form of artificial nature where life in cyberspace becomes a possibility and maybe 
the only hope for humankind to survive. The second part of the study questions is rather brief. Do you think the cyberpunk imaginary can help us and its function as warning to move past their current problems? Or does it fuel images of a future that seems predetermined and unescapable? Thank you so much for your attention. Here are the list of references I used and also the figure sources.